behalf of Father Coughlin and all those associated with him, I extend to you a holy and happy Easter greeting. May you and I, may all of us rise from the grave of our sorrows, our misfortunes, our sins, and our depressions to live the life of Christ and enjoy his peace and benedictions. Today we open our program with the Little Flower Choristers under the direction of Mr. Guthrow. They sing for us, Praise Ye the Lord by Tchaikovsky. Following this, Father Coughlin will come to the microphone to address you on the subject of the resurrection. And now, the Little Flower Choristers. Before delivering his Easter message, Father Coughlin has an important announcement which he himself wishes to deliver. Father Coughlin. Good afternoon, my friends. The Feast of the Resurrection of Christ from the Dead is a feast of peace and joy. I fully recognize that on this occasion, 
you expect me to confine my remarks chiefly to this subject. As a preface, may I obtrude upon you the unwelcome word of war. My friends, believe me, there is no nation in all the world that wants war. By this I mean that the humble men and women of every country, particularly the countries of Europe, are more opposed to war today than at any other time in their history. Monuments of death and destruction are constant reminders of the futility of war to the French, the English, the German, the Italian, and all European nations. On every hand, contrary to news releases, there is a growing resentment on the part of all men and women to the base propaganda of the warmongers who are not interested in the welfare of the common people as much as they are interested either in maintaining their own system of finance, of economy, or of political partisanship. It is regrettable that in our own nation, efforts are being made on this, the feast of life eternal, to fill the minds of Americans with the wicked thoughts of war and death. Who are they who are sounding the trumpets of destruction and beating the drums of war? They are not the unemployed. They are not the exploited. They are not the oppressed farmers. They are not the tax burdened citizens. And especially, they are not the youth of America upon whom we of the older generation have cast the burdens of our injustices. The entire world clamors for peace, and the entire world is beginning to recognize that there can be no peace without justice. What is justice? Certainly it is not the perpetuation of the status quo. I mean, the concept of justice is intimately bound up with the concept of restitution. If a thief steals your motor car, justice is not satisfied until the stolen property is restored to you. Moreover, you do not rest in peace until your motor car is returned to your possession. Therefore, is it not clear that there can be no peace without justice and that there can be no justice without restitution of ill-gotten goods? Meanwhile, the channels of news are flooded with the talk of unjust aggressors. No one defends the unjust aggressor, but no one hails him before the court of world judgment if he himself is an unjust aggressor, if he himself has committed injustices and has not made restitution therefore. I need not become more specific today. At this moment, I ask you to ponder upon these thoughts and weigh them in the scales of the principle that there can be no peace without justice and no justice without restitution. Is it not obvious to the majority in this audience that wicked men playing upon the pipes of your patriotism, are endeavoring to arouse belligerent thoughts in your hearts, not for the welfare of America, not for the welfare of its working class, not for the welfare of its youth, its cannon fodder, not for the welfare of the taxpayers, but for their own invisible ends and purposes. 
Is it not clear that these same men talk loudly about justice, but refuse to discuss the morality of restitution? The peace of which these same persons speak is translated more properly by bloodshed, and the democracy which they pretend to defend is slavery. In fine, the justice of which they prate is the perpetuation of their past injustices, of stolen colonies, of exploited populations, exploited through the agency of their international financial control. Real peace and real democracy must be born of Christian justice and Christian charity. For the past 13 Sundays, I have been discussing these subjects more or less concretely. For the benefit of those who wish to read at their leisure these discourses, I have compiled them all into one well-bound book. Today, I am offering each one in this audience this book, free for the asking. If you cannot afford to contribute towards its printing, well and good. There are a sufficient number of persons in this audience who will take care of these financial expenses out of their poverty. However, whether you can afford it or not, if you write to me this week, I will be happy to mail you almost immediately a book containing the last 13 Sundays' addresses entitled, Why Leave Our Own? And when you are writing to me, kindly include your advice on this point, namely, is it your wish that I continue broadcasting throughout the summer months on these subjects. Recognizing that this hour is your hour, I shall abide by your decision. Meanwhile, be resolute. Do not let your minds be poisoned by the propaganda of the warmongers. Do not fail to express to your senators this week this week, the necessity of passing a neutrality act that will be a neutrality act. All your enemies are active. The League for Peace and Democracy, together with the cohorts of the Father of Lies, they are pressing your senators now to pass a neutrality act that will be a mockery. Therefore, this week, I appeal to you, if you are a lover of real peace and real democracy, standing firmly by all that these imply, do not fail your fellow citizens, and particularly the youth of this nation, in helping to preserve not only peace in America, but peace throughout the world. Insist that America will keep clear of foreign entanglements. Insist that America shall avoid entering the blood business. Insist that our prosperity shall not be builded upon cannon, howitzers, poison gas, military airplanes, and all things else which are classified as the merchandise of murderers. My friends, I am sure that there will be no universal European war if America makes up its mind to keep clear of European entanglement. Are you willing to act this week? You cannot refuse this one request. I regret the necessity of intruding this thought upon the peacefulness of Easter, but it appears that the enemies of Christ's principles of peace have chosen this blessed season to impose their wicked designs upon us. In the name of Christian peace and Christian democracy which we love, 
I ask you to contribute your share within the next six or seven days in the form of a letter to your senator to keep America absolutely free from foreign entanglements. There is a necessity, an immediate necessity for a campaign of letters, not telegrams letters on this occasion, personal, short, polite letters, not only to keep America free from foreign entanglements, free from the blood business, but to keep European imperialists, European exploiters of colonies, European international financialists, European totalitarian dictators from decreeing death to the innocent populations of England and the continent. Thus, before I address you on the subject of Christ's resurrection, I invite you once more to inform me if I may send a book on Why Leave Our Own to your home and to instruct me if you wish me to continue these broadcasts throughout the entire summer. And now for the resurrection message. Last Sunday I endeavored to outline the chief events in the Passion of Christ enacted between the days of Palm Sunday and Good Friday. The climax was the crucifixion of the Son of God made man. We beheld his tortured body hanging between heaven and earth, following the unjust travesty of a trial in which he had been condemned to death because, among other things, he claimed to be the Son of God and, as proof for this statement, said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will build it up again. As we stood beneath the cross in spirit on Good Friday, we therefore withheld our judgment. We recollected, however, that Christ had gone about doing good, that he had preached a doctrine of charity unwelcome to the ears of the high priests and Pharisees, that he had exhibited compassion for the downtrodden multitude that forcefully he had driven the money changers from the temple and castigated his enemies as hypocrites, as whited sepulchers, as devourers of the homes of widows and orphans. There he hangs, his body bleeding, his head crowned with thorns, his hands and feet pierced with blunt nails. There hangs either Christ the Son of God or a blasphemer paying a just penalty for having played God. We ask ourselves, is Calvary the last act of a passing tragedy or is it but the prelude to the fitting climax of Christ's resurrection from the dead? Is the crucifixion the ignominious and fitting end of a seducer's hypocritical life? Or will it be chronicled in the pages of time and eternity as the most heinous crime ever committed by man, the crime of deicide? One need not wait long for an answer. The sepulchre in which his body soon will be laid will give testimony to the truth. If Christ is a blasphemer, his sealed grave will be an everlasting monument to deception. If he is the Son of God, as he claimed to be, his empty tomb will remain as an unanswerable argument to confound those who crucified him and confirm the faith of those who believed in him. Destroy this 
temple, and in three days I will build it up again. These words await fulfillment or denial. Thus, under these circumstances, the resurrection of Christ from the dead, or his failure to rise on the third day, will transcend in importance every other historical event. It will be the victorious climax of the drama begun at Bethlehem, or it will be the ignominious anticlimax of a career of a charlatan upon whom the entire structure of Christianity is founded, a structure doomed to dissolution and death. Immediately following the death of Christ on the cross, several extraordinary incidents occurred, incidents which indicated even to Christ's murderers that the victim of their hatred eventually would triumph. According to the New Testament, the Temple of Jerusalem was the scene of a catastrophe which cast terror into the hearts of the high priests. The veil which separated the main body of the Temple from the Holy of Holies was rent in twain. The Jewish historian, Josephus by name, faithfully recorded the fact that the eastern gate of the temple opened of itself. The Talmud, the sacred book of the Jews, makes mention of this same occurrence and fixes its date approximately 40 years before the final destruction of the temple itself, a date which roughly coincides with our Savior's death. Moreover, the city of Jerusalem was the scene of an earthquake. Rocks split open, and the dead arose and appeared to many. No wonder the Jews retreated from Calvary, striking their breasts while darkness overshadowed the land. No wonder the Roman centurion exclaimed, Truly this was the Son of God. O oh, Jesus, my Redeemer, who was crucified for the sins of the world, there hangs your lifeless form between two thieves, hanging between heaven and earth, all alone, save for the presence of the adoring angels, save for the presence of your blessed mother, your beloved apostle, and the few friends who lingered on. Where were the thousands whom thou did so miraculously feed? Where were the lepers whom thou didst cleanse? O oh, crucified Christ, sometimes we suspect that the lance of Longinus which pierced thy heart was not half so sharp as the sword of ingratitude. Having returned to the temple, the Sanhedrin set about to complete their work. No group of Christ's friends shall find opportunity to steal his corpse, said they. Thus their work must be done quickly. Accustomed to straining at gnats and swallowing camels, they recollected that the Mosaic law forbade that a corpse of a criminal be left hanging on the gibbet, lest it should defile the Sabbath. It was already four o'clock in the afternoon. At that season of the year in Palestine, the sun sets approximately at six. Therefore, steps must be taken immediately to provide for their victim's burial. They will obey the law. Yes, they will complete their plans and seal his body in a tomb. At that moment, Joseph of Arimathea intervened. Already he had obtained Pilate's consent to remove the corpse of Christ from the cross. Informed of this, 
the high priest sent a delegation to Pilate to petition the Roman governor for a last request which would concur with their designs. Would he seal the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea in which Christ was interred? Would he seal it with a Roman insignia? Would he place guards at its entrance to prevent the friends of Christ from stealing the body and using this subterfuge to deceive the populace, to embarrass the murderers by telling the people that this malefactor had risen from the dead on the third day according to his uh, prophecy? Both their requests were granted by Pontius Pilate. Quickly, Joseph of Arimathea began to perform his last labor of love. From Christ's hands and feet, the blood nails were removed. Hands which had been raised so often in benediction. Feet that had walked about Palestine on their mission of mercy. The sacred body was washed. The clots of blood were removed from this innocent flesh. The same flesh which Mary had bathed so tenderly in the stable of Bethlehem. Then Nicodemus, another faithful friend, began to embalm the Savior's body with a hundred pounds of precious mixture of spices. And finally, after fresh linen cloths had been wrapped about the corpse, the sorrowful procession began its sad, sad journey from Calvary to the tomb where the mortal remains of Mary's son were stretched upon a cold, damp slab. This done, they reverently withdrew under the flare of flickering torches and watched the soldiers roll the great stone against the entrance of the sepulchre. They watched the guards carefully cement it. They watched the captain officially fix the seal of the empire over it. Then came silence and shadows as Mary, leaning on John's strong arm, wended her way with the faithful friends back to Jerusalem to mourn, to hope, and to wait. Christ is dead. Christ is buried. There can be no doubt of that. The high priests, the Sanhedrin, the Roman governor, the commission guard, all unanimously testify to these facts. They who took so many precautions to give the lie to the seducer by the irony of justice are they who will be among the chief witnesses to what follows. Throughout the ages, the foes of Christianity well recognize that they must destroy the miracle of Christ's resurrection from the tomb before they could entertain any valid hopes of liquidating the influence of Christ. Throughout the ages, the defenders of Christianity have recognized how essential it is for them to establish the Master's resurrection from the dead. All this is the bedrock upon which rests the entire structure of Christ's teaching. It was the great Saint Paul who said, 
If Christ be not risen again, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have given testimony against God that he hath raised up Christ, whom he hath not raised up. If Christ be not risen again, your faith is vain, says St. Paul, for you are yet in your sins. All night long the Roman guard watched the tomb. The Sabbath sun rose and set upon thousands of worshippers who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover. On Sunday morning, the first day of the week, a group of Galilean women set forth from the city to complete the process of embalming Christ's body, which so they thought had not been performed satisfactorily and completely on the previous Friday. These women did not know that Roman soldiers guarded the tomb. They were even forgetful of Christ's promise to rise from the dead on the third day. Thus, as Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Less, together with Salome and Joanna, approached their friend's last resting place, one of them inquired, who shall roll us back the stone from the door of the sepulchre? Imagine their consternation when, as they approached the tomb, they beheld the stone rolled aside. Cautiously, all save one entered the sepulchre. They found it apparently empty. Suddenly, from the depths of the cavern, a light began to shine and then to take form. It was an angel who said to them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. Why seek ye the living with the dead? He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, come and see the place where the Lord was laid. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day arise again. Almost stupefied with fear, these holy women could not rise until another angel said to them, Going quickly, tell his disciples and Peter that he is risen, and that he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him as he told you. All these gentlewomen, save one, listened to this last injunction. She was Mary of Magdala. Presumably at the mere sight of the empty tomb, there burst upon her the simple fact that Christ's body was no longer a prisoner. Presumably she suspected that his enemies had stolen the corpse. Thus hastening to Peter and John, she said, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. At first, Peter and John were dumbfounded. Then the truth began to dawn upon them. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will build it up again. They remember these words. They remembered Tabor and Christ's transfiguration. They remembered every miracle which he had performed. The water that blushed to wine. The angry waves of Genesareth that grew calm. The cleansed lepers. The multiplication of the loaves. The son of the widow of Nahum. Jairus' daughter. The empty tomb of Lazarus? Why, he is risen! Held by such thoughts, 
these two apostles hurried to Golgotha. Standing at the entrance of the empty tomb, John, who had arrived first, perceived how carefully the burial raiments had been folded and laid aside. He observed how the shroud which had covered Christ's head was rolled up separately in another part of the tomb. Oh, this was not the work of enemies. This was triumph. This, this was victory. He saw and believed. These are the words with which the scriptural account closes the scene. Then followed the many apparitions of Jesus to his friends. First, to Mary Magdalene, who mistook him for the gardener. Then to other Galilean women whom he met. Then to the apostles. Then to the disciples on the way to Emmaus. Then to scores of others. Permit me, my friends, at this juncture to quote for you from Phidion's Life of Christ, wherein we read the following. And we are told of another infamy of the Sanhedrin. When these soldiers came back to their senses and overcame the fright that had been caused by the apparition of the angel, they sent some of their members to the chief priest to report the supernatural phenomena which had taken place before their very eyes. The chief priests then convoked a full session of the great council to deliberate immediately with regard to this important development which inflicted so humiliating a defeat upon them just when they were congratulating themselves upon their complete triumph over Jesus. The result of the deliberation was that they should at once by the use of money, secure the silence of the soldiers as they had previously purchased Judas' complicity. But as for their attitude towards the Savior, they were influenced solely by hatred. To the soldiers of the guard, they gave a large sum of money with this instruction, which puts a finishing touch to their business. Say you, said they, say you, his disciples came by night and stole him away when we were asleep. And if the governor shall hear of this, we will persuade him and secure you. By accepting this proposal, the Roman soldiers were accusing themselves of a grievous neglect of duty which might cost them their lives. The greed for money and the chief priests promised to fix up the matter with Pilate should the affair reach his ears induce them to accept this shameful bargain. They began at once to spread a report that the body had been taken away. Notwithstanding its absurdity, the lie spread. The Sanhedrin, we are told by St. Justin, even took pains to send out emissaries to spread the lie abroad among Jewish communities far away. And St. Augustine remarks, if the soldiers were asleep, what could they have seen? If they saw nothing, what is the value of their testimony? Thus, the truth triumphs despite this crude attempt at falsification. But more compelling than all these proofs is the permanence of the Christian church which for 20 centuries has ridden out every social, national, and international storm, professing its belief in Jesus Christ, 
and establishing that belief upon his resurrection from the dead. Upon the miracle of the resurrection of Christ stands formed the divinely fashioned edifice of Christ's church. From that empty tomb there continues to reverberate the angel's words, He is risen. He is not here. Oh, the mighty stone which sealed the corpse has become a symbol to all mankind. A symbol of life everlasting upon which is engraved the answer to the question, Whither, whither goest thou? Oh, yes, my friends, the feast day of Easter is more than a triumph of Christ over his enemies. It is also your triumph and my triumph over death and Christ's pledge to us of immortality. Therefore, with the empty tomb and the resurrection of Christ, Christianity is presented to us not only as a divinely designed system of thought and mode of action to guide our lives. Christianity is life itself. It is a new life in the sense that we who accept Christ abideth in him and he in us. It is a new life in the sense that governments adopting his principles are capable of emerging from the darkness of error and of unshackling their citizens from the serfdom of poverty. It is a new life in the sense that death and all things appertaining thereto are vanquished. It is a new life which transcends the power of imperial seals, of political factions, and of national philosophies, all of which engender poverty and warfare and terminate eventually upon a cold, damp slab in the tomb of dissolution and destruction. That has been the history of the world without Christ. That shall not be and need not be the history of the world with Christ. As for ourselves personally, how shall we interpret the resurrection of Christ from the dead? Pause for a moment to stand beside the living Christ in the streets of Nahum more than 1900 years ago, and I shall answer that question. A funeral procession wends its way down the dusty road of that little village. Accompanied by her friends, a disconsolate widowed mother grieves for her only boy who is being carried to his last resting place. As the procession passes by, Christ bids the pallbearers to pause. He walks towards the corpse, takes the cold, rigid hand into his warm hand, and says, Young man, I say to thee, Arise. To the consternation of all who witnessed this drama, the young man sat up, then stepped from his crude coffin and threw his arms about his mother's sobbing form. O oh, grave, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting? Once more accompany Christ to the home of Jairus, the Roman centurion. As you know, the kingdom of Judea had lost its autonomy. A Roman governor and Roman legions directed the destinies of Palestine. Not far from the shores of Lake Genezareth, a permanent camp had been constructed. On a gently sloping knoll overlooking the lake was the home of the captain. 
sorrow had entered this home. For days, his only daughter had been ravaged by a strange fever. The military physicians had done their utmost to save her life. But despite their best efforts, the soul of the little girl had fled, leaving behind a broken-hearted mother and a disconsolate father. Jairus was a man of action. This pagan Roman, remembering how Christ had stilled the stormy waters of the lake, how he had multiplied bread to feed the hungry, how he had shown interest in the little children who played about his knee. This pagan soldier had faith in Christ. Summoning his chariot, he set forth for Jerusalem. As he hastened towards the city, he knew that the wonder walker whom the people loved would not turn a deaf ear to his request. At length, he halted his steeds outside the temple where Christ was addressing an interested throng. Leaving his chariot, he elbowed his way until he stood face to face with the master. Quickly, he told the story of his broken heart. Quickly, the Christ responded with a sympathetic heart. Within an hour, Jesus stood at the doorway of the captain's house. The rough guardsmen, who often met death face to face, were in tears. And from within, there sounded sounds from sorrowful hearts. Pushing wide the door, Christ enters. Straight away he walks to the bedchamber where rests the mortal remains of Jairus' little daughter, clothed in white, her golden head pillowed on flowers. Behold the gentle master kneeling at the bedside. He bends over the rigid form. His hands smooth back a wisp of hair. He speaks to Jairus and tells him that the girl is not dead. She sleepeth. And lo, lo, her white pallid cheeks begin to glow with the luster of the red rose. Her eyes open wide. Her hands are in his. She sits up erect and smiles upon her loving parents. O oh, grave, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting? Or again, behold Christ kneeling before the sealed tomb of Lazarus. Mary and Martha, his sisters, are grieving at their loss. Already three days have passed since their brother had died and was embalmed. Three days since his tomb had been sealed. Jesus kneels before the great stone. He prays. He speaks. Lazarus! Lazarus! Come forth! The stone is moved. The bandaged form of his friend steps from the darkness of the tomb into the sunshine of life to greet his friend, Jesus. To kiss his sorrowful sisters. O oh, grave, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting? My friends, no wonder Jesus described himself to all of us as the resurrection and the life. For every one of you who believe within Christ, for every one of you who has lost a baby child, for every one of you who grieves for the passing of a parent, a sister, a brother, or a friend. The story of Jairus, 
the story of the widow of Nain and the story of Lazarus. These are your stories. There is no death. The proof for this? Look once more at that empty tomb of the resurrection. Look what's engraved upon it. Christ is risen. He is not here. By this he has proven his divinity by conquering death. By his own power he has raised himself from the grave and has gone forth to conquer every manifestation of death throughout the world. Therefore, the feast day of Christ's resurrection from the dead is your feast day and my feast day. It assures us not only of the immortality of the soul, but also assures us of the immortality of the body. O oh, grieving parents, grieving children, grieving lovers, your beloved one who has passed on, someday Christ will raise him from the dead, will clothe his body body with immortality. Someday the arms of your beloved shall be reaching over the parapets of heaven to greet you, you too, risen from the dead. No wonder then the Christian world raises its voice in joyous hallelujah. For this is the day which the Lord has made, the day which pledges to all of us who loved Christ, who followed Christ, and who live for Christ's principles, that the bonds of friendship are immortal, and the joys of heaven are real and eternal. At this moment, I read for you the epistle read in every Christian church today. From St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter the fifth, we read, Brethren, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new paste, as you are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice. Therefore let us feast, not with the old leaven, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. All the old philosophies of life, the old slavery, the old poverty, the old religion, they have all like the old leaven path beyond. The new unleavened bread of Christ's doctrines, the new unleavened bread of Christ's life, this shall purchase for us liberty. This shall purchase for us peace. This shall purchase for us immortality. My friends, Christianity, I repeat, is not only a doctrine, it is life. It is a life that was cradled in an empty tomb. It is a life diametrically opposed to the death of naturalism, of paganism. It is a life to be lived, not only by individuals, but to be lived by nations and all their component parts. It is a life which commits, oh, no affront against the free will invested by the Creator in you and in me. It's a free life, freely chosen, and its fruits, among other things, are joy, love, happiness, 
liberty, immortality, and peace. In these troubled times when wicked men are re-echoing the charge that Christ is a seducer, when scheming men are endeavoring to destroy Christianity both from within and from without, when unjust men are endeavoring both to perpetrate and to perpetuate the deeds of injustice, these phenomena are a challenge to all who believe in the resurrection of Christ from the dead, the Prince of Peace. The propaganda which incites the world to war is in its last analysis a propaganda against Christ because they who use the sword shall perish by the sword. Judge it how you may. The schemers, under the veil of democracy, or of justice, or of some other catchword, are plotting to perpetuate the life of some system of imperialism, of capitalism, of communism, or of Nazism, not one of which is the life of Christ not one of which is the living expression of Christianity. When shall we Christians, therefore, arise from this old leaven, from this old life, with Christ, from the tomb of our apathy? When shall we recognize that he is our king, our redeemer, when shall we become convinced that neither death nor war can be vanquished by following the impotent principles of those who spurn the divine principles of Christianity? He is arisen. He is not here, said the angel to the women of Jerusalem, who were the first to visit the tomb of the slain victim of Calvary. Certainly he's not there on that cold slab of death. He has risen. He went with James of old to preach Christ crucified in Spain. He journeyed with Andrew to raise aloft the cross in Greece. He accompanied Peter and Paul when they preached the gospel in Rome. And in later days, he was with Austin in England, with Boniface in Germany, with Cyril and Methodius in the Slovak nations, with Patrick in Ireland, with Jogues, Lallemont, Brebeuf in America, with Francis Xavier in India and the Far East. My friends, Christ is still living. He's still goes marching on, unfurling his flag of victory and of peace, your challenge to follow it. His hallelujahs are still sounding, his flag of peace is unfurled before you. He is the resurrection, he is the life, inviting every one of us to follow him. With him, we shall rise from our poverty, our crime, and our sin. And without him, without him, we will witness the world wither and see our hopes vanish. At this moment, my friends, at this moment, my friends, I again wish you a happy Easter and invite you to write to me this week for a copy of the last 13 addresses which are compiled in one book, Why Leave Our Own.
ladies and gentlemen, once more may I remind you that it is imperative for you to contact your senator this week by letter. Your opponents, the internationalists, and the deputies of the League for Peace and Democracy are agitating for war and destruction. Please ask your friends and neighbors to join with you in writing directly to your senator advocating the passage of, an in, of a neutrality bill that will be a neutrality bill. America must not go into the blood business. America must not be the cause of a worldwide war. And there will be no universal war if America keeps clear of all foreign entanglements. And as a last reminder, write also to Father Coughlin this week for a copy of his last 13 discourses which he has prepared in a well-bound book for distribution to all in this audience who request a copy. Address your letter directly to Father Coughlin at Royal Oak, Michigan. This is your announcer, Franklin Mitchell. Ladies and gentlemen, we've presented the regular Sunday afternoon address of Father Charles E. Coughlin from Royal Oak, Michigan. The